Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning uh, for the latest in our continuing series of uh, speaker engagements on topics of uh, interest to our community. Uh, we've done uh, a couple of other meetings so far this autumn on the North Korean situation, and we're delighted that uh, Dr. Siegfried Hecker is here this morning to pose for us a rhetorical question. Uh, is it time to think big uh, about solving the North Korean nuclear problem? And I think the, the answer to that is yes, and I'm counting on Sig to have the answer uh, as to what uh, big think means in this case and how it's applied to the solution space. Uh, this is, um, it's been two years almost exactly to the day since Dr. Hecker was last here for a talk. He came two years ago to present the main themes of uh, uh, a large book project that he'd had underway for a long time that, that uh, told the story of cooperative threat reduction from, from his firsthand experience. Uh, and um, today we turn to another topic of enduring interest uh, for him. Dr. Hecker had the uh, privilege, opportunity, and burden of uh, traveling to North Korea seven years in a row between 2004 and 2010 uh, to bear witness to developments in North Korea's nuclear capabilities uh, and to um, help all of us to understand the emerging challenge there. Uh, you all know Dr. Hecker, you wouldn't be here uh, otherwise. He served previously as uh, director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, as co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University, uh, where he remains a research professor emeritus in the School of Engineering. Uh, I like to think of SIG as an unemployed metallurgist. Uh, regular ski bum, because he takes off every winter to put his focus where it really belongs, uh, on the New Mexico ski slopes. And uh, unbeknownst to me until I spent a little time at Stanford was his, uh, he, he is the racquetball king. Uh, and, and anybody at CSAC is welcome to challenge him on a court at a particular time. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, he goes uh, undisputed as king of the racquetball court. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Siegfried Hecker. Well, thank you, Brad. What, what can I say uh, after that? So it's, um, it, it's great to be back here uh, at Livermore. Uh, as uh, Brad had pointed out, I, I spent, you know, most of my professional career actually uh, at the other laboratory. I guess that's what we have to call it now that Bruce Tarter called this one the American Lab. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't read his book, let, let me recommend it. Bruce uh, sent me an email, said he wasn't able uh, to be here today. But I must say, every time I look at that book in my bookshelf and it says the American Lab, it does make me wonder, so what in the world is Los Alamos, you know, <laughs> if it's not the American Lab? But he has a great introduction to actually explain. And I bring my students out here, uh, the small class that I teach in the spring, I bring them out here uh, for a, a field trip for a day. And Bruce always starts off with us and tells the story uh, of, uh, of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And he does such a great job, he's now turned it uh, into a book. Okay, uh, Brad also, uh, you know, stole my answer. The answer is yes, uh, you know, to, to this question. But I'm going to take you through a lot of material uh, before uh, I try to lay out uh, as to what that might be, uh, the think big. And, and particularly, I'm going to take you through, uh, so why does North Korea want nuclear weapons? Uh, what do they have? And, and then how did they get it? Uh, and that's before we talk about, so what do we do now? So why do they want nuclear weapons? Of course, you're out here at Livermore, you know the answer that most countries have, you know, is to deter or, or defeat aggression. Uh, he's not alone, uh, you know, because you have uh, President Trump, uh, and certainly in the nuclear posture review, it says, above all, to deter adversaries for nuclear weapons. Uh, and then, actually, if, if you uh, read or listen to Vladimir Putin, 
uh, you know, over the last six years or so, uh, he's made it very clear uh, that under no circumstances will he s surrender that strategic deterrent. In fact, I mean, he said, you know, we now make weapons that are years, and then he added, no, decades ahead of our adversaries. So these guys are still interested, they have them, so clearly that's another reason. But then there are also those guys who didn't have them. Uh, who sort of had, you know, sad endings. Uh, you know, there's Saddam on the left, and you saw what happened to him. Milosevic, uh, top center in Serbia, you know, he wound up in the International Criminal Court and actually died there uh, in prison, at a NATO prison. Then, of course, there was Gaddafi, uh, you know, who had a particularly bad fate. And then with, with Bashar al-Assad, we don't know yet exactly what's going to happen. But I've had discussions with the North Koreans, you know, and they basically say, we don't want to go there. Uh, you know, these guys didn't have nuclear weapons. Then, of course, to get really direct, uh, you know, our president a year or so ago, you know, made this comment, you know, totally destroy, you know, rocket man. Uh, of course, as I'll show you, and as you know, you know, that dialogue has changed uh, pretty dramatically, but that's pretty direct threat. So that's why. So what about what? Uh, well, last uh, November 29th, so almost a year ago, uh, the North Koreans launched uh, this missile called the Hwasong-15, uh, which certainly has the ICBM uh, capabilities. We'll get back to that. Of course, showing this at Livermore is a little bit uh, like bringing coals to Newcastle, but uh, I, I I start off with this all the time when I talk about nuclear things because it's just important uh, to take people back to just, you just don't have nuclear. You need three things. You need to have the bomb grade materials, uh, you got to weaponize and that means design, build and test, uh, and then you have to deliver. So it, it's useful for people to think through in that fashion. That's what I'm going to do is take you through in North Korea. So where have they been? What have they done? And of course, you know, for the fission bombs, it's plutonium, highly enriched uranium. If you want to go uh, to hydrogen bombs, you need tritium deuterium, or you need this neat stuff, you know, lithium-6 deuteride, which makes its own uh, tritium uh, in situ. And then for weaponization, oh, and that for North Korea, for countries like North Korea, the amount of nuclear material really does govern the size of the arsenal. So in other words, they're limited in terms of how many nuclear weapons they can have by those materials, because they don't have all that much. Uh, for the US, for Russia, that's not the case, but it is the case for North Korea. The weaponization, of course, all the standard things from physics, computers, and down to explosives, etc. Um, that governs the sophistication uh, of the arsenal. And then you get the delivery systems, uh, and you know, if you look at different countries who've developed nuclear weapons, for example, Pakistan, India, and so forth, uh, missiles uh, weren't their first means of delivery, but it looks like North Korea pretty much went directly uh, to being interested in missile delivery. And of course, that's, that is the most uh, effective. So that's what I'm gonna go do. Uh, however, with a place like North Korea, what's always important uh, is when somebody tells you what they have, you ask them, but how do you know? You know, how do you know and how confident are you? Okay, so how do we know? Well, one of the things is, uh, you know, overhead uh, uh, imagery. And, and today it's commercial. Uh, you know, back uh, decades ago, it was the purview of the spy agencies, but today it's commercial satellite imagery. And there's essentially a cottage industry out there of people who analyze uh, the commercial satellite imagery. And, and that's a case uh, right here of watching the experimental light water reactor come up. And, and at this place, this was my last visit to North Korea, 2010. Uh, they just had the containment structure uh, of the uh, experimental light water reactor come up. Oops. Uh, and uh, what was so fascinating, the trips to North Korea were just absolutely fascinating. In this case, what was fascinating, that containment structure, for those of you, you know, who've ever worried about nuclear reactor, nuclear reactor safety, you know, there's a real trick to pouring reactor-grade concrete. Uh, that's not what they did in North Korea. It was like with one of your little mixers that you use for your garage floor, you know, and then they just did it piece by piece around. They did have rebar, I must say. Uh, 
So you can watch it from the outside, and, and as you watch, you know, here by uh, December 2013, the exterior was done. But they still haven't operated it, so we're five years later. Uh, so you'd like to be able to look inside, but that's hard to do in North Korea. But it's not as hard as you think. You know, for example, here, here I am uh, in the North Korean Plutonium Laboratory. And so believe it or not, they have had people in the North Korean nuclear facilities. And there was a time during Clinton administration, the so-called Agreed Framework, that uh, there were international IAEA inspectors and actually US technical teams. And I think some of uh, people here may have uh, uh, been there uh, as well. And then they, uh, uh, as inspectors, then they allowed me in. I was not an inspector. I, I was a visitor so, to their uh, facilities. Uh, and so you learn a lot uh, from the inside. And I certainly learned an enormous amount, uh, uh, both in seeing their facilities and in discussing plutonium metallurgy uh, with these guys. Uh, and in fact, uh, as uh, Brad said, I've been there seven times. He here are just pictures of the first six uh, of those visits, um, either seeing the technical facilities at Yongbyon, I've been there uh, four times, or having discussions, for example, uh, like this one uh, right here. Uh, they didn't let me in uh, to Yongbyon at that time. Uh, this was three weeks after they did their first nuclear test. Uh, sitting next to me is the director of the Yongbyon Nuclear Center, and he was telling me how proud they are uh, about having done this first nuclear test. And I said, well, it didn't seem to work so well. You know, it was less than a kiloton. But then uh, another colleague of his, a general, said, well, Dr. Heck, of all people you should know, it's much harder to build a small bomb than a big bomb. <laughs> I said, well, sometimes, you know, the big bomb that you designed turns out to be small because it didn't work so well. <laughs> so they actually have a pretty good sense of humor. So th those were the first, um, the first six. And then the seventh was really a big surprise. That was the one in 2010 where they showed me the experimental light water reactor. And that was the time they decided they were going to go ahead uh, and show the world the centrifuge facility. Uh, and, and so let me tell you, as I'll sh show you in a minute, in terms of how much we know about their program, uh, John Lewis, uh, who's a professor at Stanford, and my good colleague Bob Carlin, uh, our common colleague who knows a lot about North Korea and I, we're the only ones that ever been inside that facility. And all we know about that facility and about their uranium enrichment program is through my half hour discussions with them. And for this one, they were not very cooperative. So it was like pulling teeth to try to find out what they actually had. And then the other way, and this is really curious, you know, when you say North Korea you know, is the black hole of the universe, nobody knows anything, they show this stuff. So they show Kim Jong-un here visiting a flow-forming machine, which is what you need to make centrifuge rotors. And you can actually figure out where the flow-forming machine is from, so you get some idea as to how they do this. But they show that to you. Okay, so here then, just to go through this very quickly, is the plutonium business, and of course you know the whole history of how you go from uranium ore to, uh, uh, to a reactor in this case a gas graphite reactor that they designed themselves, but patterned after one in the UK. Uh, reprocessing a facility, uh, they uh, patterned after one in Belgium. Uh, and I, I saw all of those. On the right-hand side on top is the reactor, on the bottom is the reprocessing facility. Uh, we put all of that together. This is the only reactor that probably has made any plutonium of, uh, of consequence. Uh, in uh, North Korea. They have a small research reactor, uh, but uh, that really hasn't contributed much. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, what they've produced. The capacity is a little less than six kilograms a year if they operate it all year round. Uh, we believe, going back and looking at all the times it operated, you know, which you know from overheads, you know when the reactor is operating, put all of that together and we say, we believe today North Korea has 20 to 40 kilograms uh, of plutonium. The Russians, we're not quite sure. Actually, I'm not sure they know either. You know, but somewhere between 125, 150,000 kilograms. Rocky Flats, the ducts, and all of those things had 13 kilograms of plutonium in it when it was finally torn apart. So it, it gives you an idea. This isn't a whole heck of a lot. But you also know, you know that Nagasaki uh, you know, was of plutonium, you know, this much, one plane, 
kilograms of plutonium one city destroyed. So it doesn't take much. So however, because we can see when the reactor is operating, we've had people there, they visit the reactor, we know the reactor uh, uh, capabilities. So we have pretty high confidence, still a big range, but we have high confidence that's where it is and the observability is high. The HEU production, um, again, you know, just the history of what you have to go through, there it's the other story, and that is the, the uh, confidence is low and the observability is very low uh, because that building I was in where they showed me the centrifuges, and, and by the way, this is just, this is actually a U.S. facility. For that one, they didn't allow uh, any photos, uh, but uh, that facility was here in this blue roof building uh, that satellites and everyone was watching everything in Yangbyan and nobody knew when I went in there in 2010 that they had this modern centrifuge facility. So does that mean our you know, Intel people are really bad? No, it just means this stuff is so easy to, to hide. Uh, so the best we can, we can figure out, or at least I can figure out, they can make maybe 150 kilograms per year it assumes they have at least another facility someplace else, uh, uh, maybe two. Uh, inventory by the end of last year, uh, around uh, 250 to 500 kilograms. Again, uh, very poor confidence in that. And so we just don't know about the highly enriched uranium. The tritium, we actually know even less, except we know they, have, they know how to make tritium. Of course, you have to make tritium in a reactor, so we have a pretty good idea uh, as to when they could have made it. Most likely, they made it in the same reactor they made the plutonium. Uh, as you know, you can just substitute, stick some lithium-6 in uh, and, uh, and breed uh, tritium. We know they have hot cells. We've been watching them improve those over, over the last few years' time, and we have good indication uh, they know how to make lithium-6 uh, deuteride. Again, confidence, very low. Observability, very low. So, so the bottom line is we put all of this together, you know, and we're not quite sure, uh, but uh, we do the best that we can. In terms of weaponization, directly, then we know even less, because that you can't deserve, uh, uh, observe any of the things related, obviously, to the computers, to the machining, to any of that. However, the bottom line, as you know, uh, from uh, weaponization is nuclear tests. And they've done six nuclear tests. And so, in other words, they know how to do this. And then, lo and behold, and here's again this peculiarity of North Korea, they obviously, there was a time when they wanted us to think in a certain way of what they had. And this was one in March of 2016. They showed this thing that people call the disco ball, you know, which they said was a miniaturized uh, uh, nuclear device. And in other photos, they actually show the nose cones of missiles uh, that, would, uh, that this device would fit into. Uh, so uh, again, they've showed this stuff. Then if you look at the nuclear tests and you study that, that history, first one didn't work so well. Uh, the second one in 2009, um, that's good enough as far as I said at that time. If they can make seven kilotons, they can make 15 or 20. Uh, in 2013, they made 7 to 14. So at that point, you basically have Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you can destroy a city if you can deliver that. Uh, they went on, uh, 2016. Uh, this one was peculiar. Uh, they said it was a hydrogen bomb, but obviously from the yield, you know, it wasn't a true two-stage thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. You would expect a higher yield. However, in thinking through this, you know, rather carefully, and again, this is all open source stuff, in thinking through, it could quite well have been a proof of principle. You know, perhaps a, a boosted primary, so they actually had some fusion uh, and called it a hydrogen bomb. They could have done other things to sort of figure out, can we eventually, what can we learn to build the, hydro, uh, to build the hydrogen bomb? Uh, which they then did two tests later, by the way, in, in 17. Uh, this one looks like it may have been close to 250 kilotons. And so we'd have to say, you know, that uh, indeed could have been a hydrogen bomb. The one in uh, September of 2016, they said uh, that was for miniaturization, uh, and it, it most likely was. So that's the test history. So uh, that means they know how to make these things. You know, they know how to make big ones. And then they actually showed this thing before this September test, 
you know, they showed this, and, and by the way, this person here showing this device is the same person sitting next to me uh, in 2006. Uh, that was the director of the Yongbyon Nuclear Center at the time. So they said, uh, they showed, they actually made this available a couple of hours before uh, that test, and they said it was a thermonuclear uh, device. Again, we don't know, we don't know whether that's what it was that they tested. Uh, we, have, we have no idea, but they clearly wanted us to think that they know how to make that and they know how to deliver that. In terms of delivery, the missile story is a long, long story. Uh, and, um, and that is from the early days when they first tried to get help from the Chinese, it didn't work out. Then they tried to get help from the Soviets and they did. Uh, with the scuds and then the bigger scuds called the nodongs, uh, and then they developed that sort of history o over uh, 30 plus years. Uh, most of the early years, um, not much progress. You know, they had these scuds and the nodongs. They did very few tests compared to other countries, and then they actually sold the nodongs to Iran and to Pakistan before they had any sort of a decent test uh, history of those things. Uh, and they put them in service, uh, so to speak. Uh, at that point, though, in the 1990s, uh, that would have been before they had nuclear weapons. And then the longer ones, the intermediate range, uh, the ICBM range ones, th those are all in the last few years. If you look back o over the histories of, of Kim Il-sung, it was like 15, uh, missile tests, the short-range ones. Kim Jong-il, uh, the current Kim Jong-un's father, uh, it was like 16 missile tests. And Kim Jong-un, he's now been in power almost uh, six years, uh, uh, not actually almost seven years. He came in December 11, uh, 76 uh, missile tests, including uh, six or seven completely new <coughs> missile types. Really quite, uh, quite amazing uh, of the progress uh, that they've made. I won't come back to this, but in the missile arena, what's quite clear that they not only got a lot of early help, uh, but it looks like they've continued to get help uh, along the way uh, until maybe, uh, you know, quite recently in, in terms of rocket engines. Uh, and mostly as one looks at what one can find, these are rocket engines that go back uh, to Soviet design bureaus that were either in Ukraine uh, or uh, in Moscow. But even if they did that, uh, their uh, record of performance is really quite amazing. So now when you put it all together, uh, you know, here's the plutonium, uh, the highly enriched uranium, tritium, not much. You know, my guess is maybe for uh, two or three bombs worth. Uh, nuclear devices, 25 to 30 is sort of the best guess. They have enough material for 25 to 30. I don't think they have 25 to 30 sitting there. Uh, at this point. Uh, and then um, could they put them on a, on a scud or a nodong? That, that would have ranges up to about a thousand kilometers or so, could reach most of Japan and, and all of South Korea. Uh, and I, I think at this point we have to conclude they, they probably can do that. Uh, then you get to the intermediate range, you know, could they reach Guam, 4,000 or so uh, kilometer, or the ICBMs that, uh, that Hwasong 15 has a range of up to 13,000 uh, 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 kilometers. Although both the 14 and the 15, they tested in a lofted trajectory to keep them close uh, you know, to North Korea, not over a normal trajectory. Uh, and for that, even though, as I'll show you later, Kim Jong-un said, y you know, we now have our state nuclear force complete. You know, we can reach the United States with a nuclear tip missile. I don't think so. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. You have three lofted ICBMs, that's all you've ever done. Uh, you've never traced them out all the way. You don't know exactly what the conditions are of the warhead that has to be inside, that has to go up, stay there, and come back down. Uh, but, you know, if either they convinced themselves or they said it for a purpose of saying, yes, we've deterred the United States, that's what they've said. Uh, they can make five, six, or seven uh, additional uh, nuclear weapons a year if their uranium and plutonium facilities continue to work. So that's where we are. So uh, in the how did North Korea get its nuclear arsenal? Uh, and I, I'm going to have to go through this uh, you know, rather quickly. 
but I'm going to try to point you to, um, uh, to this website where uh, my colleagues and I, Bob Carlin and Elliot Serbin, uh, we've done this, uh, what we call comprehensive history of the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, and in essence, what we did is we looked at 26 years from 92 all the way to 2017. I'd also previously written about the early history, and you know I, I have that in various publications, but we were especially interested from the time that Kim Il-sung, uh, the great leader, first turned to the Americans uh, and said, hey, I'm, I'm ready uh, to talk to you guys because the you know, Soviet Union had fallen apart, the Chinese were hooking up with the South Koreans, and the, the North Koreans said, hey, look, this is a bad time for us. So we go through this, and then what we do is we go across these columns. Uh, we look at what was done in terms of diplomacy. What did the U.S. do? What did North Korea do? Uh, did diplomacy actually result uh, in boots on the ground uh, in Yongbyon? Because we've concluded that's a really important part. So if you can actually have enough diplomacy, they allow you in. That, that's good. Uh, and then we trace plutonium, uranium, tritium, weaponized nukes, and missiles. And we do this for 26 years, and each one of those blocks has a narrative where we explain, based on sort of my technical know-how and Bob Carlin's political know-how, uh, he's been studying North Korea since 1974 when he was in the CIA and was in the government for many, many years. So we put it all together. And so all together, there's like 77 pages of narratives. So if you ever want to know what happened in any year, what did North Korea do, you can look this up, just go in, and it comes out. Of course, we also know that nobody in Washington reads 77 pages. In fact, we're told some people in Washington don't read at all. Uh, and so we said some people like kilographics. And so we designed this thing with kilographics in mind and said, OK, let's just use colors uh, to designate what happened. So green is good from an American standpoint, and the darker the green, sort of the better from an American standpoint. Well, it's three shades of green. Red is bad, and again, three shades of red. And so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to lay it out. And so here you are. So there's Bush one, and then there's Clinton eight years. And when one looks at this, uh, you say, who well, in particular when I show you the red, hey, that's not so bad. You know, they had diplomacy going on. They had some problems back during a Greek framework. Uh, but they sort of seem to be able to solve that. The uh, North Korean nuclear production reactor, the so-called gas graphite reactor, was activated in 86. Uh, in 94, it was frozen, halt. And two bigger reactors that they were building actually were not only frozen, halted, but they died in the process. And so the plutonium production just you know, went down. Their capacity went down. So on the plutonium, this is really good news. However, the North Koreans uh, were certainly hedging in this process. And as you know, there's the second path to the bomb uh, with highly enriched uranium. Uh, and they had explored uranium enrichment in the 80s already. But they more or less uh, you know, sort of put it aside because they were going to concentrate on plutonium. And then AQ Khan came calling. The agreed framework had some shaky moments. Uh, and the North Koreans started to sort of build up the capabilities to do uranium enrichment in case they had to go that route. So that's why this area turns pink. And, and by the way, the Clinton administration knew that. The, the CIA knew that. They knew that they were doing things that were not you know, quite in the spirit of this agreed framework. At tritium, you know, they had tritium. They did tritium research back already 60s and 70s, but didn't get anywhere. Weaponization, there's no question that in the 1980s, they already did a number of experiments in North Korea that were for bomb business, you know, like implosion cold tests. Uh, you don't do those for nuclear power reactors. And my view is, you know, came 1990s, they didn't send those guys home. You know, they continued to do something uh, during that time. So that's why it's light pink. But then in terms of nukes, you know, you see it, it turns uh, a dark green because they didn't make any plutonium. And the missiles, they were playing with the short-range missiles. But uh, in 1999, uh, Secretary Bill Perry, who at that time was out of government, actually went over there and got him to agree to a missile testing moratorium. So even the missile part went green. 
So here at the end of the Clinton administration, and in fact, Madeleine Albright, some of you may remember, she was there with Kim Jong-il uh, in 2000, October 2000. President Clinton almost went. And there are people like Secretary Bill Perry who thinks they were within months uh, of really coming to a deal where the North Koreans would say, hey, we're going to give these things up. But then stuff happened. Well, what happened, we got a new administration, the Bush administration. And the Bush administration decided, listen to these words, this was the worst deal ever made. There's also one John Bolton, who I think said those words a little later about the Iran deal. He was also there uh, during uh, the Bush administration. Uh, and so the diplomacy went red, uh, as, as you can see over here. The North Koreans didn't quite know what was going on. They were still expecting some continuity from one uh, you know, administration to the next. They, they allowed the inspectors to stay in. So there was, no, uh, there was no plutonium made. However, by 2002, there was a big confrontation in Pyongyang when uh, Assistant Secretary James Kelly went over. He accused them of cheating on uranium enrichment. Uh, and the uh, U.S. stopped its part uh, of the agreed framework. And in fact, I mean, John Bolton specifically in his book, written in 2007, was the uranium enrichment is what we needed to drive a stake through the agreed framework. Uh, and so they were convinced, you know, just as some of them are now with the Iran deal, this deal was bad for the United States of America. They made this decision. I guess my own view is, I mean, that's fair enough. These guys are in government, they're driving the boat. But if they're going to make that decision, they ought to be prepared for the consequences. And when you look at this thing going red, they were not prepared for the consequences. So in other words, by pulling out of that deal, the North Koreans withdrew from the non-proliferation treaty. They restarted the reactor. They reprocessed the plutonium that had been sitting there in the spent fuel pool. And they built the bomb probably within six months. So they traded a problem, uranium enrichment, which would take at least another decade to get there. For one in six months, they had the bomb. And they did nothing. Nothing was done in 2003. So my criticism is that criticism, you know, you make a decision, you got to be prepared for the consequences. They weren't prepared. 2007, 2008, uh, Bolton was gone by that time. Actually, Don Rumsfeld was gone by that time. Uh, Bush administration decided to reach out. Uh, and you can see things going green. And by the way, you know, those, the letters, the G2 just means a, a medium green. Uh, because some people have you know, difficulties exactly getting the shade, so we, we, we put the, the letters in. So uh, the Bush administration actually tried, uh, but by the 2008 time frame, uh, the North Koreans had something else happen, and that is Kim Jong-il had a serious stroke in, in August of 2008, and they had to worry about succession. What do they do now? They had to worry about his military. They had to look strong. They had only done one test. You know, you can see this test uh, over here. Uh, and it didn't work so well. So they had to do another test. So President Obama comes in. Well, he said, I will reach out my hand if you unclench your fist. John Lewis and Bob Carlin and I are there in February of 2009. And they're telling us they're going to do a satellite launch. And we said, oh, no, 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 don't do that. You know, President Obama wants to come. He wants to talk. And they said, that's the way it's going to be, and if you think it's bad now, it's going to get a lot worse. And it did. So President Obama came in because of that satellite launch in April. You know, things turned to an R1. Uh, the North Koreans, you know, had already decided um, uh, they have other things they had to be able to get across. Uh, young Byun presence, the inspectors were thrown out, uh, and so things in the plutonium thing went back to the red. And then from uranium enrichment is also a place where they started to beef that up considerably. And then they did another, they did that nuclear test in 2009. Then there were several more times, and I'll come back to that, when the Obama administration would have had an opportunity to get somewhere with North Korea. Uh, and 
they, for a variety of reasons, chose not to do so. I'll come back to that. But here's 2016. As you can see, things turned really bad, you know, over the eight years of the Obama administration. Uh, and then they did another test, you know, in 2013, and then two more in 16. Then comes President Trump, and everything turns dark red, and another test. So that's where we are. That, that's the how. I, again, I don't do it justice with a few words here, uh, but uh, you can look at this. So you can go back and say, how, how in the world did this happen? You, you know, here's this country, presumably so backward. Well, they're not so backward, you know. So the one thing, as you look at this, and, and as you look at the Kims over here, I've got the Kim Il-sung, uh, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un years in here, it, it, these guys were determined. Uh, and in essence, they were willing to slow down their program. They were willing in times even to reverse it but they were never willing to give it up. And that's what you learn from these colors as you see how it evolved over the years. They were determined. Uh, and in fact, the, the evolution of what they meant by deterrent uh, changed and evolved dramatically over those years from when I was first there in 2004. They told me that they had the deterrent. I actually held their plutonium in my hands in a sealed glass jar. And they said, Dr. Hecker, you've now seen our deterrent. I gave them my speech. Takes three things, you know, for nuclear arsenal. <laughs> That's only the first part. But they felt that was a deterrent. And then over the years, they felt they needed more and more. What they finally came to is they, you know, they launched a big one. And if they could put a missile on that, that certainly is a deterrent. My own view is actually, if their nodongs can reach you know, all of South Korea and Japan, that's a deterrent. You know, we have some 200,000 US citizens in North Korea. We've got 28,000 troops. OK, import and export, we also studied that. We looked very carefully every year what did they import, what did they export. We colored those. And as I can see, they always imported something. Uh, they had egregious exports to Libya and, and to Syria. Those are the dark reds that in here. Uh, but their nuclear program particularly was, much of that was indigenous. You know, they needed some help here and there, but it was indigenous. Poor U.S. decision making, that's what uh, I was just referring to. So clearly the decision by the Bush administration was a poor decision in my opinion. Obama administration made a poor decision in 2012, the so-called Leap Day deal. Where after Kim Jong-un was now um, uh, in power for just a couple of months, uh, his father had arranged this deal where they would actually go ahead and again freeze Yongbyon, freeze the plutonium production, actually allow inspectors into the uranium facility, which I thought was so necessary, do no nuclear testing, no missile testing. They had a deal. It was finally signed on February 29, 2012. The North Koreans turned around and launched a satellite. But it was clearly a satellite launch. That rocket was the UNHA. That was a satellite launching rocket. Obama administration at that point said, you broke the deal. But if you go back and you look at the actual documents, the North Koreans said, we reserve the right to do, missile, uh, to do satellite launches. The US said, no, no rocket launches whatsoever. They never had a common document. North Koreans did what they said they were going to do. Obama walked away. You look at the stuff you know, underneath that blue line. I wish we would have been able to get back in, and we didn't. Uh, and then in 2015, Kim Jong-un again made the proposal in January. Uh, we're going to go ahead uh, and do a nuclear testing moratorium if you guys don't do the military exercises. The Obama administration dismissed that in less than a day. Well, you look at the nuclear tests, the three big ones happened uh, after that time. So those are the sort of things one has to, now when you look at the map, you look at this and you say, the decisions that were made that didn't get you the sort of results that, that you'd hoped. Relying on sanctions, that's another one of those decisions also. You can just look at that. We looked at the sanctions, you know, very, very closely. What was cranked up? How was it cranked up? Uh, and here you can see it and you can look at the sanctions colors next to nukes and missiles. You would hope that as the sanctions get darker red, the other stuff goes into the green. It doesn't. Sanctions go darker red, 
the nukes and the missiles go darker red. That did not, the sanctions did not stop their program. In fact, we also tracked the North Korean economy. It didn't even turn the economy in the other direction. 2018 may be a little different, we're not sure yet. That story isn't fully written. So relying on sanctions didn't work. Uh, if we look at North-South relations, which we do in this one column, compared to US uh, uh, diplomacy, for the most part, we've been out of phase for all of these years. Well, that's, you know, they're our ally. That's not the way you'd like to work. China, you, you know, we blame things on China for all of these times. If you look at China, oh, and by the way, for North-South relations, Chinese relations, I employed experts in those countries to help me out, uh, actually say, hey, what happened? You know, what was the North Korean economy like? What was North-South relations like? So we have all of that, you know, pretty well documented. It turns out China has much less influence uh, on North Korea than we had thought. Uh, and in fact, you know, you look at the sanctions, the economy, you look at the missiles, the Chinese just have less influence. For us to rely on them to fix this issue was the wrong way to go. Okay, now I'm gonna get over uh, to the part that gets me to answering the question. Uh, so this was 2017, very dangerous year. I just showed you how the overall arsenal and everything evolved. Then we had these speeches, uh, you know, from Trump and then from Kim Jong-un saying, nuclear button is always on my desk. Of course, at Livermore, you know, there's no such thing as a nuclear button. But of course, Trump went back and said, my button is bigger and, <laughs> and mine works, he said, you know. <laughs> So, at any rate, but then comes 2018. So Kim, I mean, he, you know, if you looked at all the news media, he looked at everything in 2017. This was, you know, at least made out to be one of the most evil people in the whole wide world. We clearly demonized that guy. Look at where he is today. I mean, it's a remarkable turnaround. It started by saying, He's going to accept President Moon's um, invitation to the Olympics. Here's a collage uh, of the Olympics. This was remarkable. He, you know, the North and South Korea marching in under one uh, you know, neutral unified flag of the Korean Peninsula, uh, seeing Kim Jong-un's sister and the head of, of parliament uh, up here. Now, of course, our vice president didn't seem to be overly enthused uh, by all of this. But, but Moon uh, uh, certainly uh, was. And then he followed up uh, with the Pan Moon Jom summit. And I like photos. And I particularly, I want you to look at the photo on the lower right, you know, Moon and Kim. It doesn't look like these guys have got the guns pointed at, at each other's heads. So something happened. Uh, this was the happening of the big change. And of course, that led to this. You know, President Trump, in his own way, uh, decides to accept uh, the uh, invitation, and he goes to Singapore. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, Kim Jong-un doesn't look like such a demon anymore. They sign the summit statement, and then I, I have to say, I gotta hand it to Kim Jong-un. I mean, that guy is smart. He not only had Trump at his doorstep, Moon at his doorstep, but then he had Xi Jinping at his doorstep, and the Chinese were not getting along with the North Koreans for the previous five or six years. And all of a sudden, they're together. They were together again, and then a third time. Uh, and then uh, there's now talk of a Putin-Kim summit. Lavrov uh, uh, went instead. That's the foreign minister uh, on the lower right. So Kim has these guys at his doorstep. So here's the summit. It's been much criticized. Uh, and it had these four points. And, and the first two uh, are points of normalization. Okay? Uh, and, and to me, uh, they were two of the most important points, actually, vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And saying that, hey, you know, we need a new relationship if we're ever going to get out of this mess. Uh, lasting and stable peace uh, on the peninsula. Uh, Kim said he would work toward complete denuclearization. Uh, and then the third one is also a normalization, you know, return POW MIAs. Uh, and so uh, it was a combination normalization and denuclearization. 
However, all we have focused on since that time is the denuclearization piece. What the North Koreans focus on is the normalization piece. So uh, then let me draw the, the picture for you. So end of 17, if you look at the threat as the capability, they had the big missiles, even though, as I told you, I don't believe they can mount the warhead on there yet. Uh, but they have a capability all the way around. Then they have intent, and he said he's got the button uh, on his desk. So this was a terrible time. I mean, the risk of war was high. And it felt like that even in this country. Felt less so in South Korea, strangely enough. You know, I was there in South Korea in December, and it didn't seem like they were all that worried about it. But certainly the risk of war was high. And then you know, comes this, so where we are now. The threat to capability has not changed much. As I'll show you, they've actually taken some important steps, but the overall capability has not decreased much at this point. But the intent is way down you know, from the fact that they've had these summits. It's a totally different you know, political environment today. And so what I say, and, and this is sort of the answer to my question, this is why it's time for big thinking, is the threat of war has dropped dramatically. And that buys us space and time to actually see whether we can do something different this time as to how to actually get at the capabilities also. So the way we laid this out, again, this is on the Stanford website of, uh, of some uh, already five or six months ago. We said, okay, if we're gonna denuclearize, then we have to look at all the nuclear assets, you know, from the weapons to the people to the tests, plutonium, uranium, tritium, export, etc. Uh, the second column is, uh, uh, it breaks it down in, in, a, in a, you know, a little more uh, uh, specificity. And we say, okay, so how, how are we gonna tackle this denuclearization? Well, the word in Washington, and particularly the word uh, by now National Security Advisor John Bolton was, Get rid of everything now. You know, CBID, complete, verifiable, irreversible, dismantle. I really hate that word, irreversible. I mean, short of the loss of human history, you know, how is it going to be irreversible? The Manhattan Project was 27 months from start, you know, to finish, and we didn't even know how to build the bomb. So uh, how can you call something irreversible? Anyway, that was the idea in, in Washington. That, that's what one has to do. However, you know, that... Uh, it requires, they have to declare, they have to make a complete declaration and they, uh, then uh, for elimination. That's equivalent to a surrender and the North Koreans have made it clear, hey, we, we, know, we weren't defeated, we're, we're not surrendering, so this is highly unlikely. So what we said instead, why don't you break this up into steps uh, to reduce the capabilities and therefore the threat. And so what I couldn't help, because we got a bunch of historians over at Stanford who uh, have done nuclear history, and, and they remind me that in 1985 there was this moment where Gorbachev at one point had just come into power. He turns to Shevardnadze, his foreign minister, and he says, we can't go on like this. So Gorbachev has watched the Soviet Union, he watched the decay, he watched the economy go totally to hell, and he just said, we can't go on like this. And so that was the beginning then of the change. And then Reagan, you know, had somehow both the, the, the personal aspect of being able to actually, you know, bring about what then became the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. A similar, that I was just reminded, a similar situation occurred in South Africa in 1991 when uh, F.W.D. Clerk uh, also turned to his minister and said, we can't go on like this. Now, in that case, it was very different. You know, different was he had lots of issues and problems. The economy also had problems because he was sanctioned. But he also had the apartheid situation and the movement within the country was showing that, hey, things, you know, we're not going to be able to continue like this. But he also had a moment <laughs> where he said, we can't go on like this. And maybe it's just better to get rid of the nuclear weapons. And he did. In Gorbachev's case, of course, it was then a matter of serious arms control. <laughs> so, what I say, are we at such a moment today between the North and the South? Uh, and uh, this is the Pyongyang summit, you know, back uh, a month ago. And again, if you look at that, it is just totally amazing uh, of what happened. And, and it's that uh, sort of the moment 
the, um, the North and the South getting together and perhaps also saying, you know, we shouldn't go on like this. We should change things. And then they actually have this one, and this is a totally incredible photo. Uh, and, and that is uh, Kim and Moon on top of Mount Pektu, you know, the sacred mountain on the north by the Chinese border, uh, and holding hands. When I was in China, I, I was telling Brad a couple of weeks ago, uh, quite frankly, this, this photo freaks out the Chinese. <laughs> Uh, you know, they do not like the idea of those nationalistic Koreans getting together. So all of a sudden, the Chinese, and that's one of the reasons that Xi Jinping has gotten together three times uh, uh, with Kim, is maybe they're actually seeing that they are losing, you know, whatever influence they may have had. So now, uh, my buddy Bob Carlin says, when Kim comes to South Korea, if they go to Mount Hala, uh, which is on Chechu Island, the highest mountain, uh, and hold hands, uh, that's really going to freak the Chinese out. Then you have both the South and the North. So this, this is perhaps the moment. And then again, my buddy Bob Carlin, he reads everything. He talks to, still to the North Koreans. He still goes to North Korea. He just sees the whole situation is just changing dramatically within the North and within the North-South. And it's that North-South uh, uh, sort of detente that really opens this potential door for saying maybe it's different. And from my own standpoint, I also say, you know, for the most part, it's their peninsula. You know, it's the Korean peninsula. It's not the American peninsula. It's the Korean peninsula. And, and since politically they have bought us time, then maybe one can figure out how to actually make the denuclearization possible if we make the normalization possible. So what we laid out some months ago was to tell Washington, look, don't make it all red all at once, but rather do three stages, halt, roll back, eliminate. And say it's going to take like 10 years because the political, even though if what I just told you actually comes to be, even that will take time. Because the biggest challenge Kim's going to have is within his own country. I mean, his own country is poor. It's destitute compared to South Korea. I mean, getting you know, to, even though they are the same people, getting them back together after 70 years of having lived such different lives, that's going to be enormously difficult to do. I mean, that's going to be the challenge. We, we should be helping them. And so if we show some patience of getting rid of the nuclear weapons, you know, maybe we can do that. So the yellow here means, hey, you don't have to just say, you got to get rid of that right away. So we can manage the risks that I show in the yellow. And the red, particularly at the eliminate part, that's everything associated with nuclear weapons. It's got to get rid of that. So it's one has to do. I, I'm, you probably can't read all of these things. But we actually laid out, so what would you expect to do in each uh, of these uh, uh, cases where we laid out the, the yellow and the red? And you can see there are some, some peaceful applications of nuclear energy, uh, peaceful space programs I've got in here in the yellow to say, you know, maybe those are okay. Uh, we can manage those. So the framework then uh, says take this fa uh, phased approach. Do not ask them for a full declaration of every nuclear facility and missile facility up front. They're just not going to do that. The, you know, the trust for that doesn't exist. But encourage them to front unload some things because there's so much skepticism in this country. The taunt between North and South is really the big, the big game changer. Uh, and then, you know, North Koreans have called their nuclear uh, weapons a treasured sword. Uh, maybe they'll be convinced it's an unnecessary burden. So where we are now, it, it turns out it's peculiar. North Koreans have taken various actions already. They've actually front-end loaded some of those things that I mentioned. A and it's criticized here in the United States from pundits both on the left and the right, almost equally vehemently saying, no, that's not enough. They're, they're, doing, you know, they're not doing this. They're really not doing this. They're cheating. They're doing this. But here, what I show you in blue, they've actually done these things. You know, I had them on there. They've done. So they not only, the nuclear test, they've not only said moratorium, they actually said, we're going to stop nuclear testing. In terms of the tunnels, uh, they've actually blown up parts of the tunnels. But then, of course, the skeptics say, well, maybe they just closed the front end. One can dig through that, and they can test again. 
Well, and now, the, but they, because they didn't allow international inspectors. Now, uh, Kim and Moon, at the last summit, uh, uh, Kim actually agreed, because I was told he was enormously frustrated, Kim, that he's taking all of these actions and everybody just says, oh, that wasn't much. So now that he said, okay, I'll let in the international inspectors in. Now the pundits say, well, it's too late. You know, they should have gone in before. So how do, how do you deal with this? And, and, you know, I can have some sympathy for Kim. I've done all these things in the blue, and I'm still, you know, sort of not getting any uh, respect. So, you know, perhaps, and, and this would actually be my own personal choice, uh, the, the top, the black uh, uh, font is the same as before, but particularly if we want to get to a point of being able to verify, uh, I essentially consider the verification challenge almost impossible because compared to Iran, this is really hard because they have so much. So perhaps the best way to do verification is actually go in with the North Koreans and say, look, you know, weapons, you can't go there. And so we're going to help you. Whatever you have for weapons, we're going to help you convert that to civilian. So this experiment light water reactor, we'll come in there, we'll make sure it's safe. Uh, or if it's not, you're going to have to scrap it. Medical isotopes, you want those? Yeah, you've got a little reactor, but the South Koreans can build you a better one. Space launches, sure. Those UNHA missiles, they're good for space. They're no good. Yeah, yeah, the, the rockets, they're good for space. Then they're, they're no good for ICBMs. You can't do ICBMs. So if we'd actually go in there and work this side by side, that's the best chance to have verification. So that's um, my final slide. Uh, on the right-hand side, what I now say uh, to underscore what I just said in words is in the green, if we actually say, hey, look, you can have those things cooperatively. We'll help you develop them. <laughs> so you can have a space program. In fact, maybe what you have, actually have a joint north-south space program. That might be the best way to do that. And for nuclear medical isotopes, sure. Uh, South Koreans are going to come up, they're going to build you the Hanaro, a small little research reactor, and you can have medical isotopes. So it would take that sort of, that's what I mean by a big idea, by big think. This is dramatically different. And if you think today of the Trump administration criticism of Iran, if you're going to do Iran plus, you can forget this. I mean, you just can't get there. It's too hard. You'd have to do something totally different. But Iran is a hard problem because the nuclear was just one small piece of this broader Middle East and, and Iran messing around in the Middle East compared to Northeast Asia. In the North Korea, it's an island of instability and a sea of stability. And the North and South want to talk. And if they want to talk, we should encourage them and we should help them get to a resolution like this. Okay, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention.